Look, I think at the end of the day, art has generally been about a kind of call to our feeling, our, our emotive dimension, right? And that I think that we, the theater culture of, of, of the United States for the most part is, is really has flourished mostly in, in with that at its, at its core. I think, you know, there are other traditions, the German tradition and some parts of the English tradition where you go to the theater to, to think, not to feel. You go to think about the world and the world that we live in. I think there's a little bit less of a tradition of that in the United States. There are obviously examples there have, have existed, but it's just not something that is done as often. So, you know, I think that to ask a question like this, how did the world become beholden hmm. to an aberration of the monetizing impulse? How did finance become our way of being? And what is the result? What's the human result and what's the human cost of that? To, to not tell that tale in a sentimental way and to not tell that tale in the misleading way that you center it onto a single character, as if a single point of view could encapsulate the entire mm -hmm. system. It cannot. That's a fiction. Um, at the top of the second act of the play, once the deal is in motion, these young guys are using debt to take over a behemoth, uh, industrial behemoth called Everson Steel, which is like a Bethlehem Steel type company. And uh, they've been getting a lot of bad press for this, these tactics. So the lead of the play, a guy named Bob Merkin, who is loosely inspired by Michael Milken, um, gets up in front of the audience, uh, gets up in front of the audience who I allege is a private investor group. So it's, uh, he's addressing all of his private investors who have put money behind him to do this takeover. So I'm gonna read this speech. <clears throat> Past few weeks, the news, the papers have been filled with nasty words about a pending deal all of us in this room are watching pretty closely. Saratoga McDaniel's ongoing bid for Everson Steel, a deal which, of course, was financed by the money many of you put up. Reading, seeing some of these pieces on the news, you'd think we were like locusts come upon the land. All the idyllic images of small town American life, workers coming through the gates, hard hats, lunchboxes, fathers. The fathers who we're told will be out of a job if Izzy Peterman has his way. We're told that Sacker Lowell and yours truly are using financial wizardry to destroy the values that made this nation great. If we're the locusts now, the frogs can't be far behind, right? I don't agree with any of that. What's wrong in America right now, and there's definitely something wrong, has nothing to do with corporate debt. I mean, all the fear-mongering around this deal, the waxing poetic about the death of American manufacturing, I sometimes feel like I've stepped into a collective delusion. The bizarre, self-serving belief that we Americans are somehow better than others, that American-made is better, whether it's American steel or American cars or televisions or whatever. No evidence is offered. Just nostalgic rhetoric about what our fathers sacrificed and how great they were and how we here in this room are endangering the legacy they left behind. And you marry all this Norman Rockwell sentimentality to the nasty xenophobic tirades about slink-eyed Asians copying our stuff and the dirty spicks taking our jobs, and you have a picture of what is actually wrong in this country today. There is a blindness out there, and it is not the blindness of those who see nothing but dollar signs. No, it's the blindness of a nation unwilling to question itself, unwilling to learn from the evidence of the marketplace. Because see, the marketplace is telling us that our steel isn't as desirable as steel made in China. It isn't as cheap, as quickly produced, or superior in any way. The same with our cars, appliances, electronics, the Japanese, making all these more cheaply and better. That's the truth. Honda is a better car. That's why I drive one. What do we hear in this country? We are Americans. We invented the automobile. We built the greatest steel mills the world has ever known. God bless America. Let's set aside the revolting assumption that God does not bless other nations, or that somehow an American father's job is more important to his family than a Chinese father's job is to his. Let's set aside those lies, those delusions, and let's stick with the facts. Fact, they are winning. Fact, we need to understand why. Fact, we need to change. When you stay blind, you can't change. And when you don't change, you die. That is what is happening in this country right now.
We're selling junk in Izzy Peterman's company, Saratoga McDaniels, for him to go after Everson Steele. The bonds are paying 17% quarterly coupon, rated triple C. Bob? Murr, I want you to come in for more than usual. We're making our first play on the Dow Jones. Right. Shoulder to shoulder, Murray, deal by deal. That's what we're doing. We're making them see we can be the big muckers, too. I, uh... I need you, Murr, more than ever. Bob, I have to talk to you. It's Macy. She all right? Your wife okay? No, she's fine. Okay. It's just, I mean, uh... I'm at a hundred million in liquid assets. Bob, she just, she doesn't want me to take any more risks. She wants me to stop. She or you? Oh, I don't want you to be mad. Four, maybe five million. That's what you came to me with seven years ago. Well, it was Macy's money. No. It was all hers, her dad. No, that was hers. The rest, I made you. I make you rich. I don't know. I, I, I've been watching, you know, my dad made, me, made a deal with me when I first moved to New York in my mid-20s. He said, if you read the Wall Street Journal, I'll pay your rent. So I had to read the Wall Street Journal every day. And well, so for two years. Why is that? Why the Wall I think Street Journal? He wanted me to, um, you know, I, I had studied literature and religion in college. And I got to New York. And he and my mom was like, you know, my dad was like, what is this kid? Is he reading poetry all the time? You know, is he, what is, how, how is he going to make a living? And so um, they, they concocted this plan. And I think he knew me well enough to know that if I got, reading about something that I get interested in it and I did and it was an interesting time in New York and uh, people you know Tina Brown had just taken over the New Yorker and there were profiles of financiers alongside profiles of Mikhail Brishnikov and in culture circles people were talking about money so it was an interesting time to be thinking about money and as an observer since my mid-twenties of what's happened in America it struck me that the rise of finance is really in many ways the great and most important untold story of why things have changed the way that they have. And at the root of the story of finance is debt. Well, first of all, you mentioned the word debt. And nobody knows more about debt than I do, because I owe billions and billions of dollars. But I'm a professional. I mean, I know what I'm doing, and it worked out very well. I negotiated a couple of deals with banks and this and that, but you know, I had a lot of friends who went bankrupt. You'll never hear from them again. I never did that in the early 90s when I was in trouble. I owed billions and billions of dollars. And in a certain way, I love debt, because in good times, there's nothing better than debt. In bad times, it comes back to bite you. So we talk about debt. We talk about the assets and the liabilities of debt. And generally speaking, it's a liability, especially if you're not a really skilled professional. Why did you make it? In a sense, that's lucky. God has to have blessed you with a good mind or at least a business mind. A Taco! Yes, Tom? Goodyear. Kodak. Ford. What is this about for you? Shoulder to shoulder, Murray. Deal by deal. That's what we've been doing. Fine. It's my ass is going to be hung out to dry. Well, you know about uh, CEOs. <laughs> You're a winner. We are making the world. No deal with Peterman and Max. It's a hell of a place. I am going to bury them. Prove myself worthy of my father's charge. We got it. We got it! You know, the play's about the, inst about the system, right? It's not about any individual because I think we have this illusion. You know, we go to a movie and we see, oh, that guy and, oh, our point of view. We can understand the whole system from some person's point of view and what he wants and the moral. Petulant good and bad, evil, evil and it's good. It's nonsense. It's not how the world works. And so storytelling, in a way, is doing all of us a great disservice by promulgating the idea that we individually can somehow understand the old system. So the play is an attempt to stage the system. And you have law enforcement, you have the fourth estate in journalism, you have finance, you have legal, you have all of these systems that are interlocked. And at the end of the play, as you were talking about, you know, law enforcement and government sort of gets married to finance yeah. in that moment, which hopefully is a surprise, but is probably also inevitable. It's about debt financing. And so what I do is I take a, a leverage buyout deal that turns into a hostile takeover and I put the entire deal on stage. Lawyers, accountants, arbitrage guys, investment bankers, management, legal for management. 
and I show over the course of 68 scenes and 30 characters and three acts, the transformation, the philosophical transformation of moving from a world where we make things to a world where money makes money. Things make money versus money making money. And to me, at root, most of the problems that we're dealing with have to do with this abstraction. Times. And, you know, as Jim Stewart said in his piece, he wrote Den of Thieves. I mean, it's not, there is a, there's a game that you can play where you can say, yeah, that's Milken, but it's not Milken. It isn't actually Milken. He never gave a speech like that, that I just read. And he didn't take the plea. And he didn't do all these things. So it's kind of loosely inspired and, and concocted for fictional ends. And those ends are about speaking to what America has become now. And I am not trying to um, uh, create a historical record of Rudolf Giuliani's you know, tenure as the US Attorney of the Southern District. I'm simply trying to say that it seems to me that even the process, due process, and the law and the justice system have become entrammeled with this process of money in America. So has the fourth estate. It seems to me that when Les Moons can say, Trump may not be good for America, but he's good for business, there's a fundamental abdication of the very reason that CBS even has a license to broadcast. That license was offered to CBS with the assumption that they were going to also tend to the public good. We have forgotten all of that. So the play is an attempt to address the reality of what we have become. It's not an attempt to tell a story of what once happened. Why us? Mr. Peterman, hmm? what did we do to attract your unwelcome attention? I'm fighting a battle to keep a business alive that's been in my family and in my community for three generations. Why don't you just go away? Find some other tree you can prune and piss on to your heart's content. Tom, you don't have Busy. to. Busy. Do you mind? Mr. Everson, due respect, we all live in the market. We respond to the market. We grow with the market. The market is the rule of our being. And those who don't obey the market begin to lag. And when they do, they draw notice because they're weak. And the weak are eventually consumed. Is that so? Now, sometimes a company can hide that weakness with accounting tricks, say, declaring losses in one division against profits in another. It can buy time, but eventually the truth comes out. Are you threatening me? On the contrary, Tom, Everson Steel has a great future. But that future is not in steel. You seem to be the only one who doesn't get that. And then yet in there, in this system, you have these people who are being corrupted or destroyed or turned into monsters. I don't know. I, yeah, no? I, I don't know. I don't see it that way. I, I, I think that, you know, it's, it's hard for me to write a character if I don't love them. Uh -huh. And it's hard for me to write a character if I don't identify where they come from. You know, Mil Merkin and, and the guys that he's surrounded with are fighting the good fight. And for them, they're really fighting a fight to, to, f to make a place for themselves at the heart of American life, at the heart of American business life. They are shut out by the blue blood old, you know, guard f firms. And they are transforming. It's a disruptive technology that they're bringing to the table. They don't know what the consequence of that disruptive technology is going to be. Right. So, you know, in this play, there are, there are blue blood wasps more or less and there are jews yeah um a latino guy and, and there's an asian american woman yeah but there, there are a couple yeah <laughs> um so so t talk about the dynamics in that was that a um it's an important part of the history of that era um you know malcolm gladwell talks about it eloquently in outliers there was a, a generation of young lawyers uh you know joe flom and marty lipton and and uh who represented a kind of vanguard generation in mergers, mergers and acquisitions. Well, the reason that, that those guys kind of took over at that particular time that they did, the late 70s and 80s, was because before then, doing takeovers was considered bad. And blue blood, white shoe firms would not do that work. Those firms, Mudge Rose, um, Cravath Swain, they would also not hire Jews. So if you were Jewish and you'd come out of law school, Brooklyn College or wherever, you couldn't get a job at those firms doing the not takeover work. So you did work at other more Jewish firms 
which specialized in hostile takeovers and leverage buyouts and all of that sort of stuff, which at the time was not a big thing. But then it became a big thing, and very quickly. And the only guys who knew how to do that work were the Jewish law firms. Right. So Skadden Arps and others, those, that was the rise of that whole generation. And so a lot of this financial technology in the 80s, in the early days, was immigrant driven. I mean, Louis Ranieri at Solomon Brothers was the guy who came up with mortgage-backed securities. He's Italian, come from an Italian family. But if you can understand where somebody is coming from, how can they really be that despicable? I mean, if you can really understand where they're coming from, it's hard, it's, it's hard to hate them when you really get what's driving them. I mean, what's driving Merkin in the play is a sense of having been not acknowledged, his family, his father not acknowledged for what they are, which is great and really good at what they do because his father was Jewish, couldn't get a job at all these firms and ended up balancing the books of dry cleaners and dentists. And, and Merkin knowing that, that, that the, the white blood, you know, the white shoe, blue blood guys are trying to keep them out. And, you know, I think how do you not identify, I mean, how do I not identify right. with a guy like that? You know? Right. But he's breaking the rules. You know, he's not, you know, he's breaking the rules, he's breaking the law, he's hurting breaking people. Breaking rules, he's breaking, I mean, the, the Continental Army broke the rules <laughs> of, you know, engagement with the British. I mean, it's, right. whose rules?